Now it's clear that Starship Block 2 is facing problems, especially with leaks, which are proving to be quite fatal. But after three flights, why hasn't SpaceX been able to solve this yet? Let's dive into this issue today, try to understand the deeper root causes, and hopefully come up with some ideas or solutions. Let's rewind a bit to the most recent Starship flight. Not long after stage separation, it became apparent that there was a developing leak, possibly in the false ceiling of the payload bay. Despite this, the nitrogen purge system seemed to keep things under control for a while, allowing the ship to continue firing as planned. However, almost immediately after the engine cutoff, the ship began to tumble unexpectedly. It attempted to correct its orientation using other vent systems, but it soon became clear that additional leaks had developed, this time in the internal fuel systems. These systems are crucial for attitude control and help keep the vehicle stable during its coast through space. Because of the leak, the tanks were unable to maintain the necessary pressure. Without that pressure, the attitude control thrusters, which are essentially gas jets, could not function correctly. The result was a loss of control. You could see particles drifting around inside the payload bay, their motion shifting as the ship's spin worsened, clearly illustrating the uncontrolled tumble. Of course, once the attitude control system failed, the outcome was essentially sealed. The vehicle began spinning uncontrollably and, not long after, burned up during re-entry. So, while we now have some idea of what happened during Flight 9, the exact reason behind the failure remains a mystery, largely because SpaceX has been somewhat vague about about the details. However, what we do know is that Starship's leak issues actually trace back to Flight 7, which was the first flight of the Block 2 variant. After investigating Flight 7, SpaceX stated that the most probable root cause for the loss of the ship was identified as a harmonic response several times stronger in flight than had been seen during testing, which led to increased stress on hardware in the propulsion system. The subsequent propellant leaks exceeded the venting capability of the ship's attic area and resulted in sustained fires. The leading theory now is that SpaceX has not fully solved this issue yet. With each flight, they have introduced new methods and upgrades to mitigate the effects and strengthen the vehicle against fire damage. That's likely why we've seen the ship survive longer in each successive flight. However, the underlying harmonic issue may still be present, continuing to damage key components, causing leaking issues, and ultimately preventing Starship from completing its mission successfully. Harmonic problems in spacecraft, especially during launch or flight, refer to vibrations or oscillations that occur when certain structural components or systems resonate at specific frequencies. These vibrations can place excessive stress in parts of the vehicle, potentially leading to leaks, mechanical failures, or even fires. One of the most well-known forms of harmonic instability in rocketry is known as pogo oscillation. Pogo is a self-excited vibration seen in liquid propellant rockets. It is caused by combustion instability which leads to fluctuations in engine thrust. These thrust variations then cause changes in the vehicle's acceleration, which affect the propellant flow rate and pressure. This feedback loop completes the cycle and reinforces the vibration. While pogo typically originates in the engines, it can also affect tanks and piping systems. When SpaceX introduced Starship Block 2, it came with thousands of changes compared to previous versions. Most external changes are clearly visible and well documented. However, many internal upgrades, particularly in the vehicle's plumbing, are equally significant. One major revision involved the propellant transfer system. In earlier versions of Starship, a single methane downcomer extended from the common dome to the thrust puck. Near its base, this line split into three smaller pipes that fed the three vacuum-optimized Raptor engines, RVAC. This unified system meant all six engines, the three sea-level Raptors and the three RVACs, drew fuel from a shared feedline. While this design had its own limitations, it also had a benefit. All engines experienced the same pressure fluctuations, and the interactions between them could sometimes help dampen instabilities such as POGO. For example, pressure spikes would reach the sea-level engines slightly earlier due to the shorter feedline lengths these engines could react faster. 
and friction losses in the RVAC lines likely reduced the pressure seen at the vacuum engine's pumps. As a result, any instability introduced by one group of engines could be partially balanced or canceled out by the others. However, in Block 2, SpaceX appears to have shifted to a different approach. The updated design features four downcomers instead of one, including three dedicated methane feed lines, one for each RVAC engine. This gives greater control over pressure and flow rates to each engine individually. While that precision can be advantageous for efficiency and engine management, it also removes the multi-engine dampening effect that was present in the earlier design. This change may have unintended consequences. Longer feed lines, such as those now dedicated to each RVAC, are known to increase the severity of pogo oscillations. With each vacuum engine isolated on its own line, there is a possibility that pogo behavior, perhaps previously suppressed by the combined system, can now emerge and amplify. It is also possible that small-scale pogo effects were already occurring in earlier flights, but the shared feed line was enough to keep them under control. Now, by isolating the vacuum engines, SpaceX may have inadvertently created ideal conditions for pogo to manifest and intensify in the individual lines. The reason SpaceX still hasn't fully resolved this issue after all this time is because it's one of those problems that can only be truly understood during flight. Vibrations like these typically only manifest under real flight conditions, at altitude, and under sustained acceleration of around 3 Gs. During an actual launch, conditions change rapidly, second by second. For instance, the resonant frequency of a downcomer pipe that's fully submerged in liquid oxygen will change as the fluid level drops. So, if you run a static test while the tanks are full, everything might appear stable, but that doesn't reflect what happens during flight. Of course, SpaceX could attempt a full-duration static fire at varying fuel levels to better simulate flight conditions, but realistically, the ground support infrastructure likely isn't capable of withstanding such stresses. We now know that the ship's static fire stand can handle at least 60 seconds of firing. However, conducting a full 150-second booster test would be a different challenge altogether. Each second of such a test would produce a sustained cloud of superheated steam that engulfs the entire launch site. Worse still, the water-cooled steel flame deflector plate beneath the pad would be subjected to continuous erosion. A full-duration static fire could potentially degrade the plate enough to make it unsafe for future operations. Moreover, the clamping mechanisms holding both the ship and booster in place during these tests were not designed to withstand the intense mechanical stresses they would experience during a full-length burn. So what can SpaceX do? What are the possible solutions? Well, they actually have a few options. One possibility is reverting to the single downcomer design used in the original Block 1 Starship. On the surface, this might seem like the safest way to avoid the current vibration issues. However, this approach comes with significant downsides. It would require scrapping every Starship currently in production, which would result in months of delays. And even then, there's no guarantee that the original design wouldn't encounter similar issues. Additionally, SpaceX likely wants to retain the vacuum-jacketed downcomer design as it appears to play a crucial role in long-term propellant storage, a key requirement for deep space missions. Given all that, it seems that instead of trying to sidestep the issue, the more viable path forward is for SpaceX to focus on solving the problem within the current propulsion system architecture. Making the new design work is likely in their best long-term interest. Now, what about moving on to the next version? Technically, Starship Block 3 includes a number of upgrades that could help mitigate the fuel leak issues. One major improvement is the switch to Raptor 3 engines. According to Elon Musk, Raptor 3 is designed to operate without a base heat shield, which reduces mass and actually improves reliability. 
For example, if there's a small fuel leak, the propellant would simply burn off in the existing plume of plasma. This is far less dangerous than a leak occurring inside a boxed-in engine compartment, which poses a much greater risk. However, Raptor 3 is still in the testing phase and is not yet flight-ready. In addition, the new generation of starships and boosters designed for Block 3 can only launch from Pad B, which is still under construction. At the same time, there are still three more Block 2 vehicles available, and they can only launch from Pad A, given that. SpaceX might as well use them and gather as much data as possible, even if these earlier versions have been more problematic. After all, valuable lessons learned from these flights could directly inform and improve the Block 3 design. So, what is the best thing SpaceX can do right now? If the main tank develops a leak and pressure is only somewhat reduced, there is a good chance the Raptor engines can still restart. In that case, one possible approach is to perform leak detection in orbit. If a leak is detected, the vehicle could initiate the deorbit burn immediately, before the tank pressure drops too low for the Raptors to start. Alternatively, SpaceX could equip the vehicle with composite overwrapped pressure vessels, COPEEs, containing pressurization gas as a backup system. If the main tank pressure drops too far, the COPVs could be used to restore it, allowing for a successful engine restart and deorbit burn. They might also consider adding a secondary reaction control system that is not dependent on the main tank to regain or maintain attitude control. While this may go against the philosophy of the best part is no part, it could significantly increase the ship's chances of surviving the mission and returning useful data. Ultimately, even partial success would offer valuable insights to improve future designs. The leaking issue on Starship is a critical problem that must be addressed quickly before SpaceX can attempt a full orbital mission. If Flight 9 had reached full orbit, the cryogenic leak would likely have prevented a successful deorbit burn potentially causing Starship to break up and scatter debris over an uncontrolled area on Earth. This means SpaceX not only needs to demonstrate successful Raptor engine reignition in orbit, but also must prove one of three things, that the system can tolerate and function through a leak, that leaks are effectively prevented, or that they can detect a leak early enough before the final few hundred meters per second of delta-v are applied to safely abort and divert the vehicle to a controlled splashdown in the Indian Ocean. What they cannot do is simply hope future missions avoid cryogenic leaks. This issue must be resolved before committing to full orbital flights. That said, SpaceX is full of exceptionally intelligent and capable engineers. There is every reason to believe they will develop an innovative solution that many of us on the outside might not even anticipate. If you have any good suggestions for how to fix the Starship leak issues, feel free to share them in the comments. We're also aiming to reach our goal of 10,000 subscribers, so if you enjoyed the content, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Thank you again for your support.